Hi, and welcome to our January Frontline Call. I'm Rachel Damrauer, Director of Member Communications at CMS. I want to thank you for joining us today. This call is reserved for our practices that support us with 100% physician membership, so I'd like to take a minute and thank you for your membership. If you have any questions during the call, please type them into the Q&A section at any time, and we'll answer questions at the end of the call. Uh, just a reminder that the PowerPoint slides and recording will be shared with you after the call. To start, I'd like to turn it over to Katie Jordan, CMS Membership Liaison for South Central and Eastern PA. Katie? Thank you, Rachel. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. As Rachel stated, I'm Katie. I'm the Membership Liaison for the Eastern Half of Pennsylvania. My counterpart, Janet, and I always love to take this opportunity to just say thank you for supporting us through membership and also invite and encourage you to reach out to us. There's nothing we love more than talking with members, adding value to your membership, and trying to help in any way we can. So whether that conversation is over the phone, via email, or in person, please know that we welcome you um, and encourage you to reach us for any re reason. We're always very grateful for the opportunity to say thank you and just help in any way we can. So our contact information is there on the screen please feel free to get in touch. I do want to take just a few moments to touch on some important reminders. Uh, very important, thank you to those of you on the call who have paid for your 2020 membership. Of course, we appreciate you as members and, and value you. For those of you who maybe have not paid yet, I just want to do a quick reminder and say dues are, um, are due, and we're ready uh, to help you. If you have questions about your invoice this year, we know they look a little different. We encourage you to reach out to us. Again, Janet and I just love to talk, and we would love nothing more than to answer any questions you might have um, about invoices or anything else. So just a quick reminder, if, if you haven't seen an invoice um, and you're wondering where it is, again, just reach out to us. We'd be happy to help. We do have several awards within the Pennsylvania Medical Society. We love to take opportunities to recognize the wonderful physicians we have in, in Pennsylvania, and this is a great way for us to do that. But in order to do that, we really need your help. So we have three awards where the deadline is upcoming on January 13th for any nomination. If you look at these topics and you think, oh, I work with a great physician who's under 40, I encourage you to just take a look at the nomination page and you can see the link there on your screen read a little bit about those awards. If anybody pops into your mind, I encourage you to nominate. If you have questions or you need help nominating, you're not sure what to do, again, just reach us. We're always willing and able to, to assist in this matter. So that top position under 40, the Distinguished Service and the International Voluntary Service Awards have a deadline of January 13th for nomination. So I encourage you to just take a look at those. The other opportunity we have to recognize these great physicians is within the Everyday Hero Award. Uh, personally, this is one of my favorites because it's, it's always just a humbling and rewarding experience to meet with our everyday heroes, to present them with this award, and to hear from others how they have touched, uh, touched lives and just made a difference in their patients' world and also in their, their colleagues' world. So the Everyday Hero Award is a monthly award. We accept nominations throughout the year. We do keep those nominations for at least 12 months. So if anybody pop, pops into your head where you're like, oh, man, they're always doing the right thing, they're always going above and beyond in whatever capacity that might be, that might be a great opportunity to recognize that person within the Everyday Hero Award category. Again, we have a website there. It does um, specify you know, kind of what the award is. It gives a slight description. But if you have more questions, we encourage you to reach us. One of the unique opportunities in Everyday Hero is your patients can nominate their physicians. Or if you have a physician, you know, we're all patients. So if there's a physician that you see, not necessarily work with, that you feel would be a great fit, we encourage you to um, to maybe share this with your patients, put it in a patient area, or think about it from a patient perspective for your own, um, for yourself, and go ahead and nominate somebody. The last point I'd like to um, make is 
we have the 2020 year round leadership academy um, we are taking registration currently there are several scholarships available the scholarships are a wonderful opportunity to be a part of this academy and hone your leadership skills again there is a website that offers a description and it does detail the topic matter the time commitment so if you have some questions like that you might be able to find that on the website if you're not finding what you're looking for or you have additional questions please feel free to reach out to us. Again, Janet and I love to talk. We love the opportunity to help our members and um, just add value. So at any point, if there's anything within the medical society that you have questions about or you think we could help with, Janet and I encourage you to reach out to us. Other than that, just thank you again for your membership and being with us today. And back to you, Rachel. Thanks, Katie. Next up, Deanna Field, uh, one of PMS practice support specialists, is going to discuss highlights of the 2020 Medicare Physician Fee Schedule. Deanna? Thank you, Rachel. Good morning and Happy New Year. Thank you for joining us today. Like Rachel said, I'm Deanna Field with practice support, and I am pleased to present the 2020 final rule highlights. Let's begin with the update. CMS has made to the Quality Payment Program for the reporting year 2020. The Advanced Alternative Payment Model is one of the payment tracks that is a subset of an APM, which is a payment approach that gives added incentive payments with the exclusion from missed reporting to provide high quality and cost efficient care. Those that meet the criteria where at least 75% of the clinicians in the APM use a certified EHR, a medical home model, or bear a significant financial risk while using quality measures comparable to MIPS. CMS is continuously reviewing and updating programs to include in the list of advanced APMs. CMS identifies a QP by calculating patient count or payment amount threshold by analyzing the results through snapshots of data throughout the year in the months of March, June, and August. To review the program in greater detail and check to see if you qualify, please use the link to the QPP included on the slide. Now moving on to MIT. Here are some highlights to mention. Payment adjustments for performance year 2020 will be made in 2022. The maximum negative adjustment is set at 9%, while the positive payment adjustment can be upward of 9%. Quality measures must meet a 70% completeness threshold, and reported measures that fall below this threshold will receive zero points with the exception of small practices that will continue to receive three points. In the cost category, there are 10 new episode-based measures added this year. Reporting performance for promoting interoperability data must be using 2015 edition certified EHR technology. MIPS weighted scoring categories and performance periods for data submission will remain the same for 2020. Quality is at 45% with a 12-month performance period. Cost remains at 15% with a 12-month period. Improvement activity is at 15% with a 90-day performance period. And promoting interoperability is at 25% and a 90-day performance period. The performance threshold for 2020 increases to 45 points from 30 points. So let me break down the points that result in either a negative, neutral, or positive payment adjustment. The negative payment is 0 to 44.99 points. A neutral score is 45 points, where a positive payment is, 40, is points greater than 45.01. And exceptional performance is weighted 
at 85 points or more for an additional positive payment. While there have been changes to MIPS program each year, long-term improvements are needed to align with CMS's goal to develop a meaningful program for every clinician, regardless of practice size or specialty. MIPS value pathways, or MVPs, will be specialty or disease specific. An example of this would be surgery or diabetes. The idea is that within the next five years, Participants will be able to use or leverage their EHRs to report and receive credit for the program. Quality will be moving to population-based measures reporting through administrative claims. CMS is creating a new participation framework in 2021 that will unite and connect measures and activities across quality, cost, promoting interoperability and improvement activity performance categories of MIPS. Incorporate a set of administrative claims-based quality measures that focus on population health or public health priorities. Streamline MIPS reporting by limiting the number of required specialty or condition-specific measures. Now, how does CMS truly bring the programs together? This diagram, from left to right, shows how the current structure is with the reporting with separate activities and measures. The plan is in the next one to two years, moving in increments and progressing to value to align and connect measures across quality, cost, promoting interoperability and improvement performance categories of MIPS for different specialties or conditions. And in the next three to five years, have fully implemented pathways with the foundation of promoting interoperability and population health measures. CMS states this new framework will simplify MIPS, create a more cohesive and meaningful participation experience while improving value and reducing clinician burden. Additionally, the MVP framework honors CMS's commitment to keeping the patient at the center of their work and achieving better outcomes and lowering costs for patients. The final rule this year offers no significant changes for documentation. CMS finalized in 2020 to retain the current coding and payment structure using either 1995 or 1997 documentation guidelines. Physicians can review and verify the chief complaint in history, focus on patients' health changes and issues, and update the medical record accordingly. CMS no longer requires documentation of medical necessity for home visits, thus allowing the physician to decide if the home visit is necessary. Looking ahead into 2021, CMS is largely aligning the evaluation and management coding with changes laid out by the American Medical Association CPT editorial panel for office-based outpatient e and visits. For 2021, Level 1 New Patient e and Code 99201 will be eliminated and all other new patient codes will stay the same. The codes for established patient e and visits will remain, however, code definitions will be revised. The new rule will allow clinicians to choose e and visit level based on either medical decision making or time. Appropriate use criteria has been in effect with voluntary participation for the past year. The program is moving forward in 2020 with mandatory AUC consultation and reporting effective January 1. This year is referred to as an educational and operations testing period. However, CMS is expecting full participation. Physicians that order advanced imaging such as CT, MRI, PET, or nuclear medicine must consult the clinical decision 
support mechanism system for guidance via their EHR or internet browser. The reporting information is then furnished to the imaging professional, and then the appropriate modifier is added to their claim. Here are a list of resources to help you navigate the program. CMS states that claims will be paid in 2020 without AUC consultation. However, the program is expected to be fully implemented by 2021, and claims without AUC consultation will then be denied. So if you have not yet set up this process, this is the time to start. CMS has expanded chronic care management with a new add-on code for non-complex chronic conditions. G2058 is a Medicare-specific add-on code billable with CPT99490 for an additional 20 minutes of clinical staff time. Chronic care management is for patients with two or more chronic conditions expected to last at least 12 months or until death. CMS created new codes for principal care management effective January 1. PCM was established to provide services for patients with only a single serious and high-risk chronic condition. Code G2064 is for at least 30 minutes per month of services provided by a physician or other qualified health professional, and G2065 is for at least 30 minutes per month of services performed by clinical staff under the direction of a physician or other qualified health professional. To help increase physicians' use of transitional care management, CMS is, not, is now allowing concurrent billing of the care management codes that were previously restricted from being billed with PCM. At the end of my presentation, a link to Click Consult, you will see all of the details for transitional care management, which will include the list of the unrestricted codes. In an effort to alleviate administrative burden, CMS has allowed practitioners to obtain a single consent from a patient covering multiple communication technology services. The single consent must be obtained at least once per year, as opposed to the previous requirement of once per service. The consent must also include patient cost-sharing responsibility. Good news for physicians implementing remote patient monitoring service. CPT 99457 is currently written is billable after 20 minutes or more of clinical staff, physician, or other qualified professional time with a patient in a calendar month. In response from stakeholders stating that additional time spent monitoring a particular or a more complex patient is warranted, CMS finalized add-on code 99458 to reimburse for an additional 20 minutes of time spent monitoring a patient during a calendar month. Here is a list of all the quick consults available that are either originated or updated for 2020. Please read and download them to share with your staff. Thank you, and back to you, Rachel. Thanks, Deanna. Uh, just a reminder, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A section, and we'll answer them at the end of the call. Next, Angela Boateng, PMS General Counsel, will give an overview and an update on the state's venue rule. Angela? Thank you, Rachel. Good morning and Happy New Year to everyone. As Rachel said, my name is Angela Boateng. I'm the General Counsel for the Pennsylvania Medical Society. Today, I'd like to provide a quick update on the Pennsylvania Supreme Court's proposed change to Pennsylvania's Medical Professional Liability Venue Rule. Before we discuss the proposed change, I would like to start where the law stands right now. Under the current venue rule, if a plaintiff decides to sue a physician, the plaintiff must file the lawsuit in the county where the alleged harm or medical error occurred. 
there are other nuances to this law which could further expand the plaintiff's venue options for filing the lawsuit, but this is the basic gist of the rule. Now here's the change. In December 2018, the State Supreme Court's Civil Procedural Rules Committee recommended a change to this rule that would increase the number of options a patient has or a plaintiff has in selecting a venue to file a lawsuit. Under the committee's proposal, in addition to being able to file the lawsuit in the county in which the medical error occurred, the patient could file the lawsuit anywhere the defendant could be served. This would include any place the defendant resides, lodges, as in a hotel or an inn, or anywhere that defendant does business. The plaintiff could also file wherever venue is authorized by law and wherever the property which is part of the action or the lawsuit is located. Um, and given the current expansion of um, hospitals across Pennsylvania, um, there are a number of different venues that could be selected. The committee invited public comments in response to the proposal, which were due at the end of February 2019. PA Med, patients from across the Commonwealth, and various other stakeholders from the medical community submitted hundreds upon hundreds of comments in opposition to the proposed change. PA Med submitted a 101-page comment document opposing the changes by, demonstrating the positive impact on the current rule in eliminating venue shopping in the Commonwealth, underscoring the importance of the current rule in maintaining the stability of Pennsylvania's healthcare system, and offering a thorough analysis of the estimated impact of the proposed rule change on the medical professional liability costs and insurance rates across the state. PA Med is concerned that any change to the proposed rule would undo the stability of the medical malpractice climate that was created with the passage of the venue rule and various other tort reform measures under MCARE, the Medical Care Availability and Reduction of Error Act. If adopted, the rule could reintroduce venue shopping, a practice where plaintiff attorneys look to file a lawsuit in a high verdict counties or high verdict counties like Philadelphia where they believe they are most likely to get a favorable outcome for their client. In addition, PA Med is concerned that if adopted, the proposed change could lead to decreased access to quality patient care, increased professional liability insurance premiums, and physicians less willing to practice in Pennsylvania. PA Med's comments also advocate for collaboration between Pennsylvania's legislature and the judicial branches as well as an open public process in the development of any new rule. This particular request actually came to fruition with the passage of Senate Route Resolution 20 of 2019. Recognizing the potential deleterious effects of the proposed rule change, the State Senate approved Senate Resolution 20, which directed the Legislative Budget and Finance Committee, otherwise known as the LBFC, to conduct a comprehensive study of the impact the change would have on the availability of medical care across the Commonwealth. The resolution requested that the State Supreme Court await the results of the study before acting on any proposed change. The State Supreme Court, in, February, in a February 2019 letter to the House Speaker, Mike Terzai, agreed to wait for the report. The release of the report, which was due at the beginning of this month, has been delayed. The LBFC has indicated a tentative release date of February 5th. On this tentatively scheduled date, the report's findings will be shared with the joint legislature during a meeting that will be open to the public. As you can imagine, PA Med and the medical community are eagerly awaiting the release of this report. So please stay tuned for additional information through PA Med communications and website. Also, please visit PA Med's website for additional background information on this issue. Thank you. Thanks, Angela. Uh, just a reminder, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A section, and we will take questions now. All right, we have a question. Are you able to nominate PAs, CRMPs, and or behavioral health specialists who work in the practice? Uh, all of PMS awards the nomination criteria is that it be a physician member. Okay. Um, can you please provide the documentation requirements for the CCM and PCM codes? The um, documentation requirements may be detailed in our quick consults. I, although our quick consults are quite comprehensive, I don't know if it's 
uh, detail that exactly, since I don't have the quick consults with me now, I'd like the opportunity to reach out to them uh, individually. Okay. Um, we are a FQHC, and we were informed that we were exempt from AUC. Is this only if we furnish the diagnostic testing at our FQHC, or are we also exempt if we are ordering provider of the diagnostic testing? Since this one's quite specific, um, I'd like to address them individually on this. Okay. Um, is there any update on prior authorization regulations? Right now, uh, there is a Senate bill and a House bill uh, that PA Med is supporting in terms of uh, prior authorization reform. Um, beyond that, not much to update at this point. Okay. Um, where can I learn more about AMA documentation guidelines for 2021? That's a great question. Since the AMA was so instrumental in helping develop the upcoming changes for the final rule, AMA's website is uh, the best place to check for the guidelines for documentation in 2021. Okay. How can I monitor the 70% data completeness requirement? You need to implement your quality data uh, collection into your workflow whether it be through your super bill or within the visit template of your EHR. These strategies can boost collection of data up to 100%. Regardless how you are reporting your measures to CMS, be it claims, EHR, or a qualified clinical data registry. If we don't have an EMR, are we excluded from the AUC program and don't have to consult a CDSM? Unfortunately, that is no. Uh, all you need is an internet browser to consult the AUC for advanced imaging. The links um, we have available in our quick consults and on the slides that will take you to CMS, a um, list of approved clinical decision support mechanisms, and many of them you can use free of charge. Okay. Um, Will the slides from today be available? I can answer that yes. I will send them out after our presentation, and we will also have the recording available to help. Um, another one, are they eliminating level one codes 99201 and 99211? No, uh, 99211 for level one established patient office visit is staying the same. 99201 was deleted for the reason being that 99201 and 99202 are associated with straightforward medical decision making. Okay. Have you considered facilitating a community specifically dedicated to EPIC reporting and management? Um, that's another one that, that we'll have to get back to that person um, individually after the call. Okay. Were there any changes to the hospital-based provider's exemption to promoting an operability portion of MEPS? That's a good question that I'd like to address individually. Okay. Is there any other questions? I think we've gotten through all the questions. I want to thank you for joining us on today's frontline call, and we hope you'll join us for our next monthly frontline call on Thursday, February 6th at 1130. Thanks, and have a great day, everyone.